We are in Psalm number 33, and we'll go ahead and read this psalm together. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery, and an instrument of ten strings, sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment, and the earth is full of good, the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, and beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looketh upon, them all, upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king, save by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in the famine. Our, souls waited, our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, according as we hope in thee. Now this beautiful psalm here, we're going to title this, Our Hope is in the Lord. Our Hope is in the Lord. Psalm 33, we're going to divide the psalm up this way. Psalm 33, verses 1 through 7, is going to be praise to God. Verses 1 through 7, praise to God. Then verses 8 through 11, and I'll repeat these. Verses 8 through 11 is fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Verses 8 through 11. Then 12 through 19, God's power versus man's weakness. Verses 12 through 19, God's power versus man's weakness. And then 20 through 22, confidence expressed. So let me repeat that. We're going to divide up the psalm this way. Verses 1 through 7, praise to God. Then, after he praises to God, verse 1 through 7, verses 8 through 11, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. The verses 12 through 19, God's power versus man's weakness. And 22 through, uh, 20 through 22 is confidence expressed. So let's take this first section, praise to God. Now, David, as he writes this song, is beginning to praise the Lord. He says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely. For the upright, you know, right, the righteous ought to be praising God. We ought to be praising God. We ought to have something good to say about the Lord. We ought to have something uh, good on our lips about God. You know, our lips aren't made to curse. Our lips aren't made to be foul. Our lips aren't made to complain. They were made to praise the Lord. You think of the angels. What are their jobs? They're up there singing praises to God. Now, if one of the angels was sour, walking around, oh man, i got to praise God every single day. It's the same thing. Praise today. Praise tomorrow. What are we going to do the day after that? Praise God. How would he fit in? How would he fit in amongst the angels? Now, they're not vexed by all that praising. They're not miserable for all that praising. They're enjoying themselves. They're praising God because they were created to praise God. What were you created to do? You were created to praise God, and why would it be something that would be a burden to you? Instead, it says, for praise is comely for the upright. Comely, that means it adds to your beauty. It adds to your beauty. You know, we ought not to be vain people, always concerned about our beauty. Oh, do I look good? You know, where should, where we're, we're always primping and making sure everything's just so beautiful so that we look so good to everybody. But we ought to be concerned that we look right. We ought to be concerned that we're presentable, and we ought to do what, what uh, furthers our attractiveness, our natural beauty. In other words, we ought not to try to look dumpy and ugly on purpose. Uh, we ought to do what beautifies us, and what beautifies you more? 
than praising God. Amen. What beautifies you more than singing the praises of Almighty God? He made you. It's comely. It's, it adds to your beauty. You know, nothing takes away somebody's beauty sometimes than when they start to talk. I can remember I was in the restaurant and I worked as a waiter and there was a, a lady there that I was uh, getting ready to take an order. And it was something right out of what you would, uh, what you would, what I remember seeing when I was, uh, you know, used to watch some movies and so forth. You'd see these situations where the the, the woman who was giving me her order was a a, a young, attractive uh, lady, and when she started to talk, it was so squeaky and like nails on a chalkboard that I literally was like trying not to make a face. I was like, like so surprised because it's not the sound you expected to come out of her mouth. She, you expected something beautiful, something sweet to match the presentation, but it wasn't. It was scratchy and squeaky and high pitched and just awful. And I thought to myself, that shouldn't that, that doesn't go together. It was so surprising, like that's not the person speaking to me. You know, if you were talking on the phone with that person and then you met them, it'd be completely different. Sometimes you talk on the phone and you hear the voice and you picture the person. Then you meet them and they don't look anything like that. You know, you think you're talking to a 67-year-old overweight man and it turns out to be a 20-year-old young strapping man or it's the other way around. Uh, and so sometimes you just have this, um, th this attractiveness that goes together with something but how, much, how quickly does it ruin the attractiveness of a person when they begin to complain? And so they don't praise the Lord. Instead, they open their mouth and, and, and just uh, uh, ugliness comes out. And sometimes you're just surprised by what you would think to be the nice presentation of a human being, and then all of a sudden they open their mouth and they wipe away all the good impressions they've made because their mouth opened up and all the filth came out. And you just think, wow, it's just, not, it's just not right. It's just not right. And so beauty is added. And we ought to add beauty. We ought to add beauty to our lives. We ought to add beauty to other people's lives. We're Christians. We are tr doing what God has called us to do. Why not add beauty to everything that we touch? Why should we go to the lowest common denominator and add ugliness to everything or just keep it all the same? Why not improve it? Why not make it better? We're Christians. We ought to raise people up and raise our, 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 uh, our neighborhoods up, raise our children up into a higher level. But God says uh, that we're to praise with the music. It's the same principle when it comes to the music. Notice he says, praise the Lord with the heart, sing with the psaltery, and the instruments of ten strings. You know, it's the same principle with the music. Sing unto him a new song. We are going to recognize that God wants us to beautify everything. Now why is it that when we sing our songs, we don't pick up the uh, rock and roll song and sing something to get us all dancing? It's because we are trying to beautify what we touch. We're trying to use it as perfect as possible, and that's why we don't use that kind of music to worship God with. Because it can be better. It can be cleaner. It can be purer. And we want to try to make our music clean and pure. So we stick with a simple melody, and we sing it. And we don't rock it and roll it because that's the way that we believe that God is honored. And God says here, we're to sing skillfully. We're to do the best we can for God. We recognize where some of this music has come from and we reject it. We see the fruit of it in the lives of the, cult, of the uh, rock and roll culture. Why bring it into the Christian culture? Just because people like it, that's why. They like it where they had it, and they want to bring it into the Christian culture and then praise God with it. But we see where it's taken all the rock and rollers. How many of them lead an exemplary, godly life? Not many. And why? Because that is fitting to the music. So we take the good, clean music, and we try to use that to worship God with That's why we choose our music the way we do. It's not a... It's not a situation where, well, we just like this kind of music and other people, they like their kind of music and everybody chooses their own music. No, it is on purpose. Amen. It is because we want to do what the scripture says, sing unto him a new song. A song that is fit for a new life. We left an old life, a life of rebellion. Yeah! 
kill them all. That's the kind of music you get. And that's what they say when they sing those kind of songs. And that's the feeling you get. And you can mark my words if you listen to the right kind of music when you were lost and you were mad. You turned on your kind of music to make you feel more mad. And you wanted to grab a hold of somebody by the throat. Because that music said just that. You're angry and I'm affirming it. And it was all right there in the music. And then you were sad because your girlfriend broke up with you or your boyfriend broke up with you. And what did you do? You turned on that old sad song. And the song just ministered to your heart and made you feel like you were the lowest person on the earth. And you wanted to crawl under the car and let it roll over you because you were so sad. And that music did that to you. But the Bible says, sing a new song. Well, what would reflect that new song? Well, it's a song that reflects a new life. Let it be the kind God speaks about from heaven. The kind where he says, make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Amen. So we sing that new song. And then we see that uh, not only are we praising the Lord, but God's got such good character. Uh, for the word of the Lord is right, and His works are done in truth. We're going to praise Him for His character. Oh, God's got such great character. Everything <clears throat> He does is right. Everything that He says is His works are done in truth. The word of the Lord is right. You know, everything in God's book is, is trustworthy. Amen. Everything. You know, we just don't know what else is in there. That's the problem. If we knew more what was in there, we could trust Him more. And everything He says is right. In fact, we says stuff we don't even see it in there until later when we've read it before, but then he just kind of taps on our hearts and says, hey, I'm just going to open up your eyes and show you. This is the verse for you to listen to today. And then we, we apply it to our lives and it changes us. He's right the whole time. And we're not. And so we, we see his word is true. And he's right. Everything he says is correct. And, you know, his works are done in truth. Everything that God did, he does right. You know, we don't need to complain against God. He does it all right. Everything, even if we don't understand it, even if it brings sadness to our heart, even if it breaks our heart in two, he's still good. And not only is he still good, but he does everything right. And when he does it, we can recognize that the God of truth is behind it. The God whose works are always good is behind it. I can't see why he does it, but he's got a good motive. We're not going to impute to him bad motives where we think God is doing us a, a wrong. God is taking from me what's mine. No, God doesn't take anything of yours because you don't own anything. Right? Nothing you have is yours. Not your money, not your job, not your health, not your ability to work, not your family, not your wife, not your children, not your husband. Nothing is yours. It's God's. And you need to live that way. Because when He does take, because He does, we can't get upset with Him and blame Him as though He took what was mine. You know, somebody said, there's only one thing in this world you own. And that's your sin. That's yours. That's all you. You chose it, and now it's yours. If there's anything good about you, it's because of the Lord. But if there's anything evil about you, that's all on you. And you own that. But other than that, if God wants to have my sin, by all means, he can have it. I don't want it. That's the only thing that's mine, and I don't even want that. I want all my riches to come from Christ. Amen. And I want those riches to reflect his perfecting me, and so I can praise him. He's perfecting my praise. He's perfecting my music. He's perfecting me in his works. God loves it. He loves, beautiful, the, the, he loves righteousness. Look at verse 5. He loves righteousness and judgment. You know, God loves righteousness. In the book of Hebrews it says he loves righteousness. He hates lawlessness. He hates sin. He hates transgression. God loves righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Everywhere we look, God is good. He's filled it with food. And you know, the more people eat, the more food there is. The more we breathe, the more air there is. The more we drink, the more water there is. In California, they're suffering from a lack of water. But it's not that the earth is out of water. It's that their little area is in a bad, bad drought. But we still have plenty of water. And they said that during this flood of the past couple of weeks that has happened somewhere in the Midwest over there, that there's been enough water to, un to undo the drought in California. That's how much water just in a few days has come down and, uh, of course, destroyed a lot of homes. But the earth is filled with the goodness of God. There's lots and lots of goodness in there. And it, it is it continually full. The more we use it, the fuller it gets. He says that the word of the Lord were the heavens made. You know, we start and we think about God's character, but then we think about His majesty in creation. You know, when you, you ought to... We live in the city, and it's almost impossible to do this, but you've got to appreciate God's majesty in creation. It's amazing to see a little bug. 
It's amazing to see a snake or a bird. Uh, I found two possums today in a garbage can. Uh, the lady told me up under a tree we had to cut was two garbage cans where the guy was trying to grow potatoes. And apparently one was empty and one was full. And I thought it was empty. It had a hole in the top. I looked in and there was a possum. It's like, whoa, didn't expect to see that. I looked in again, there's another possum. There's two of them in there, male and female. So, um, of course, nobody wanted to touch the garbage can, so I just picked up and took it out and left it over there by the side. And then uh, they did whatever they were going to do. But uh, we can see those things and we can be, uh, it's hard to be impressed at all when you see a possum. It's more disgusted. Uh, sorry for possum lovers. But uh, th there is, there's mountains. There, there are mountains to look at. There are uh, oceans to look at. There is rivers and waterfalls to be impressed with God's beauty. There is sky, uh, sunsets and skylines and majest majestic clouds and, and rainbows and things that you should look at and think on the majesty of God and let it fill your heart with, impress with, with how impressive He is. He's majestic. He's the God of creation. And the Bible says here, that uh, he made it all, made the host of them by the breath of his mouth. You know, he just spoke a word, and it came into existence. If God's word is so powerful, what must his hand be able to do? Right. Just his breath is that powerful, what must his whole arm be able to do? If his, just his breath is that powerful, what, what, is his, what are his legs and arms able to do all together? I mean, God is a majestic God. You look at all those stars... And you think of the hosts of heaven, and he just spoke them into existence. We can hardly see stars here in the city. But if you ever get the chance to go out of the city, and you look up and you realize there's a hundred times more stars than you can see here. And they're just beautiful. And then if you ever get the chance to see like a meteor shower, or if you get the chance to see the um, uh, Aurora Borealis, or the Milky Way, I mean, you get this impression, you know, the Milky Way is just lots and lots and lots of stars all gathered together in a beautiful a view, and, and God just spoke it into existence. He's so majestic. He's so powerful. It is something to praise the Lord about. But then we go in, and we look here in verse 8, and it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. You know, we ought to fear the Lord. Not only ought we to praise the Lord, but we ought to fear the Lord. And if you're going to have hope in the Lord, you're going to have to praise Him. And you're going to have to fear Him. And to fear Him means to have reverence and awe of Him. Notice it says, let all the earth, um, uh, let all the earth fear the Lord. And it says, let them stand in awe of Him. You know, a good picture of someone who is in awe of something is to stand. You know, when somebody walks in the room and they are a very high dignitary, everybody stands up. And everybody's just impressed. You know, the bride walks into the room and everybody stands up and it gets quiet. And they see the lady walk down the, the, the uh, center aisle. And there are times when you just stand up in awe. You know, if you saw, if, if we were to be outside and, and uh, we were all having a conversation and there looked what looked like a giant streak of, of um, blazing um, meteor going across the sky real slow, you know, we'd all stand up. And we'd all be staring, and we'd be looking, and we'd say, what is it? I don't know. And we'd all be in awe of it, because we would you know, have, it would be in rapt attention. That's the picture. Stand in awe of God. Don't think that God is a, uh, is, is a, uh, a small thing. Don't think that God is just a, uh, a, a being that doesn't care. Understand He's the one who spoke the world into existence. He is God. Stand in awe of Him. He is, um, he is able. He is able to do wonders, and He is a powerful, powerful God. We should stand in awe of Him. And notice what it says in verse 9. For He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. You know, when you stand in awe of God, you can repeat that thought. You get up there and you look at how that sun comes up in the morning and it brightens up the whole sky and you see the clouds disperse and the fog lifting and, and you can just remind yourself, He just spoke this all into existence. What an amazing God He is, repeating that. Just spoke it and it happened. That's a great and powerful God. And His power is not only awesome in His majesty, but it also is wonderful here. Notice uh, it says 
in, well, let's see, verse uh, 10, the Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. You know, God is not only majestic in his creation, but he's majestic in his wisdom. His wisdom is gorgeous, it's beautiful. People are, the counsels of his enemy just come to nothing. People conspire against God to do all they're going to do, and he just snuffs it out, and they just stop. He is able to overcome anything. He's able to win every victory. Nothing that man is going to attempt is going to be smarter, wiser and than God. They can join hand in hand, and they can think that they're going to win, but they are not. And God brings their counsels to nothing. It says, the counsel of the Lord stand forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. You know, his wisdom is greater than our wisdom. That's the lesson to be taken from that. His wisdom. We should look to his wisdom. That's why when we ask ourselves, how then should I live? Well, we go to our Bibles. And we have him tell us. Because we're about as smart as a rock when it comes to figuring it out. You look at Adam. What's the first thing Adam did when he sinned? He hid, hid himself in the bushes. He didn't want to be with God. What's the next thing he did? He started getting out this needle and thread, and he started sewing fig leaves together. And he made himself aprons so that he could cover up his shame. We have no idea what we're doing. We know we're not right, but we don't know how to fix it. And Adam tried to fix it with some aprons. And God came down and he made them coats of skin. And what does that symbolize? Those tunics, those, those robes. They were symbolic that God was going to not only cover their sin, but He was going to cover their shame, and He was going to teach them how to live. He was going to tell them how to do it, because when they tried to figure it out on their own, as smart as they were, they butchered it. They ruined it. They didn't get it all right. For one, they're hiding. For two, they tried to cover their shame and it didn't work. Instead of saying they were sorry, they blamed each other and blamed everybody else, and they didn't end up fixing the problem at all. But God did. He did it with his wisdom. In a moment's time, he not only revealed the plan of redemption, he covered their, their, their bodies in modest clothing, and next thing you know, they're walking around right with God in just a moment's time because of their faith in the power of God. He had the wisdom, and they only had ideas that were failures. And so God set, set them straight. So we look here. Now, as we get into, uh, let's see, what is our next section? Uh, verse 12. It says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, God's power is going to be now compared to man's power. So we're praised, we've praised the Lord. We've, we have uh, set about to fear the Lord. And now God's going to uh, David's going to compare God's power and men's power. He said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth the sons of men. You know, God's looking at everything we do. God sees the righteous and he sees the unrighteous. He sees it all. He doesn't, uh, he, nothing is past his eye. He is a very um, observant God. He hears it all, he sees it all, and he marks it all down. And he is watching at all times. So he's looking at both the righteous and the unrighteous. He sees you in every thought you have. He sees you in every um, intent of your heart. He sees you in all of the, uh, the littlest things that you do. And he writes it all down. And he also sees the, 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 the righteous and he sees the unrighteous. And he marks down our works. And notice also what he says here in, uh, let's see, verse 15. It says that he fashioneth all their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. You know, this is a wondrous thing about the gospel. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, there's more than one way to get saved. In the Old Testament, they got saved one way. In the New Testament, they got saved another way. And in the garden, they got saved one way. And in this way, trust, trust what God said. He fashioned all their hearts alike. All the men of the world have the same heart. When you take your Bible... And you go and you try to speak to somebody about their soul and their heart, and you take your Bible, you're going to find that every time you come across the exact same thing. Everybody's heart's alike. They're all the same. They're fashioned the same way. And so when you're dealing with people, they don't all have the same objections. They don't all have the same um, obstacles in coming to Christ, but all their hearts are the same. And you know what? 
The gospel applies to all men. The gospel fixes hearts of men because even though it's a one gospel fits all, it's a one gospel fits all because everybody's got the same problem. Throughout time, since Adam, men have had this same problem, the rebellion of their heart. God has fashioned their hearts alike, and they have rebelled against that fashion. And they have rebelled against their maker. And instead of standing in awe of him, they hid in the bushes from him. And therefore, the remedy is the same. It has always been the same and will always be the same. God fixes men's hearts. Right. Instead of having to rebel against God, they can now humble themselves before God. Instead of having to fight Him and hide in the bushes, they can now walk with God in fellowship with Him. Instead of having shame and guilt, they can have that placed on the Lamb, and their shame and guilt covered with the coats of skin, and they can walk with their God who substituted His life for theirs. Right. And this in symbol with Adam and Eve, but in reality with Jesus Christ, we have a God who has fashioned all men's hearts alike. So when the preacher stands up and preaches the gospel, everybody can hear it and get saved. He doesn't have to have a gospel for each and every individual person. There's not a gospel for the Jew and a gospel for the Gentile. There's not a gospel for the rich and a gospel for the poor. There's one size fits all. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And because he came to save sinners and all men's hearts are fashioned alike, we can now present the gospel to every man. And every man can be saved. Whether they're a person in Africa who's been in the jungles their whole life and never seen a Christian Bible, never heard of Jesus or seen a cross, or if there's somebody who sat week after week in a gospel preaching church whose heart is a heart of stone and they have heard the gospel a hundred and a hundred times more they can still hear the same truth and be saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because men's hearts are all fashioned alike. And so since he's fashioned their hearts alike, he's also fashioned the remedy all the same. And so we can have confidence <coughs> that what we need to learn is the gospel. When you've learned the gospel, you've learned the answer to all men's problems. Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We have a Savior and our hearts are all fashioned alike. And so what we find is that uh, God is comparing His strength to our weakness. And He says here in verse 16, There's not a king saved by the multitude of a host, a mighty man not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety, neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. You know, there's not a, um, there's not a, uh, a power in the world there's not a strength about amongst men that can overcome the Lord Jesus Christ. There is not a there's not a um, a horse. There's not a weapon. There's not a um, a band of men. There's not a constitution of men that have come together and organized themselves. No power is going to overcome God. It it almost seems ridiculous to have to point it out, but God does. Why? Because men are that stupid. That's why. They really are that stupid. And why are they that arrogant to think that they can overcome God? Because he doesn't do anything. Have you ever seen the kid who looks over at their parent when they're doing wrong? And their parent doesn't say anything, so they do it again. And then they look over again, and they do it some more, and they just keep checking to see if mom or dad's going to do it. And then after a while, they just forget. But then, they've gone so far that the parent just flips their lid and jumps up in anger and yells and screams at the kid and the kid cowers in the corner. It's not good parenting. But the truth is, is if he doesn't get up, if she doesn't get up, the kid just keeps going and keeps going because they know they're getting away with it. And so they don't think judgment's going to come. What they think is that I am going to um, continue to get away with it while I can. And so men think that way. If God doesn't rise up and stop them, they think that in their foolishness that they have actually come to a place of strength. And they stand up to God. And God says, no, nope, not all your strength, not all your power, no kings, no strength, no strong men, not even horses will save you. Not a chance before God. However, if we look here in verse 18, Behold, I, the Lord, is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. It's not the strength of men that causes them to be redeemed out of the power of their uh, troubles. It's not the strength of men that causes God to be impressed. It is the fear of the Lord that causes God to act. He says, 
his eye is upon them. And that means his eye is upon them for good. Not just his, he's looking at them, but his compassionate, loving, protective, uh, supplying eye is on them. He is there for them. He's looking upon them. He's watching over them. And it says to keep them alive in the famine. When it's tough, when it's difficult, God will be with you. And God will help you. And so what we find is that uh, God is merciful to those who fear him. You know, it's an important thing to recognize that all through the Old Testament, God's blessing is upon those who fear him. And the Bible says of the fool, there is no fear of God before his eyes. And we preach the gospel. And we tell people they need to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and they'll be saved. And what do we mean by that? We mean nothing more or less than what it said in the Old Testament, that they need to fear the Lord. It's the same thing. We say, how is believing upon Jesus the same as fearing the Lord? Well, remember what God preached, what Christ preached, what John the Baptist preached, what Peter preached, and what uh, the apostles preached as they, he, Jesus come, sent them out. He, they preached, repent and believe the gospel. Well, what does it mean when you call men to repentance? It means that there is no fear of God before their eyes. And they need to rectify that. Instead of having a disrespect and no reverence for God, they need to humble themselves in dust and ashes and come to the place where they reverence God. Where they now, instead of disrespecting God with their lives, they yield themselves up to God and say, I am not made for this. I'm made to praise the Lord. I'm made to bring Him glory. And therefore, I should fear the Lord rather than disrespect Him. So when we say, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saying nothing more than come to the place where you fear the Lord. You know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So far be it for us to say that somebody could get saved without fearing the Lord. They haven't even had any wisdom yet, and yet they've been shown by the Holy Spirit how to be saved and have eternal life makes a complete contradiction of the Bible. How could we say that somebody comes to the place where they can believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, shown by the Holy Spirit to receive Jesus and have eternal life, and they have no wisdom yet? No, not so. That's the greatest wisdom there is. Jesus has become, been made unto us wisdom. According to the Bible, 1 Corinthians, He's been made unto us wisdom and righteousness and, sanct and, and uh, sanctification. He has been made these things unto us where we receive the great wisdom of God when we receive Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. So when you get saved, you fear the Lord. Your faith brings you in repentance to a fear of the Lord. And so it is sophistry, it is foolishness to think that anybody could be saved without the fear of God. Because the Bible, you read all, if you were to read through the Old Testament, you'd find all the promises are made to those who fear God. And all the curses are against those who do not. How could you think that somebody's saved if they don't fear God? It's right there in the Bible. He says, uh, verse... Uh, Let's see, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. You see that word, hope in His mercy? They're trusting in the Lord. That is the direction of God. That's where our help comes from. And so we see this confidence is expressed here. That's our last section. Confidence is expressed in God. He delivers them. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. God has become to us a shield, a protector, a something, someone to rejoice in, someone to lean upon, someone to thank for, to be thankful for. He says, verse 21, for our hearts shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. You see how the repetition and the different aspects are put forth. First he says fear, then he says hope, then he says trust. You say, well, we just believe in getting saved by faith. And we do. We believe in getting saved by faith. But what happens when a person has confidence in God? Well, he trusts them, right? What happens when a person has trust in what God is going to do for them? He hopes in the Lord. What happens when somebody comes to the place where they repent and believe the gospel and they put their confidence and receive Jesus while they become for the first time a man who fears the Lord? They no longer disrespect him and think he is nothing and diminish his character, but they exalt him by humbling themselves and saying, I cannot save myself. I've come to the, I've come to the rock that is higher than I. 
as the song says, I've come to the cross of Calvary upon which I have to humble myself and the door of heaven is so low that I have to get up on my knees and crawl through it. Not with my sins, not with my works, not with my power, but I come humbly with nothing in my hand and I bring nothing wherewith I can make myself righteous before God or even recommend myself in the slightest bit of nothing in me to recommend me to God. I am accepted in Christ. Thank God. We can rejoice. But you see how he says they fear the Lord. They hope in the Lord. They trust in the Lord. And anyone who has faith has these attributes rolled into it because that and that alone is saving faith. That is what Christ demands of us. That we receive Him. Not just that we believe about Him intellectually, but that we receive Him. And we have this kind of faith that produces hope and it produces uh, the fear of God. And then we see this, uh, we're, we want to emphasize this, our heart shall rejoice in Him. You know, we, we do rejoice in God. We can rejoice in Him and we must rejoice in Him. And it's a good sign when His people rejoice. Rejoicing is not only expected, but it is enjoyed. You know, you ought to re enjoy rejoicing in the Lord. You ought to enjoy the time when we praise God together, thinking upon Him, never hurts to think upon something good that happened in your life. God is good. Amen. And to think upon Him is good. And we find this in the last verse, 22. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in Thee. His mercy. What expectation do you have? According to the hope that I have in God, His mercy is going to be back upon me for it. According as I trust in the Lord, I expect for God to uh, to be merciful to me. Do you expect the mercy of God? He says his, new, his mercies are new every morning. That His mercy is towards those who fear Him. So we ask for this mercy. Let Thy mercy, we're asking for it together. Let Thy mercy, O Lord, <clears throat> let Thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, all of us. I want God's mercy upon you, and I, you, you want God's mercy upon me, and we want God's mercy upon all of us. Because His mercy is going to be uh, doled out to those whom He loves. And we want to be those people that God loves. He loves the world, but He doesn't promise good things to everyone. He says, blessed are, and then He fills in the blank with them, those people. Blessed are, and those people are those who fear Him. Those people are those who have been humbled by Him. Those people are those who are His chosen people that He has redeemed out from amongst the earth. He's called them out. You know what that's what a church means? The word church. The word means an assembly of people called out by God to meet together outside of the world. Obviously not outside of the earth, but outside of the system. He calls us out to come together to worship. And as we hope together in the Lord, we are a church. Because we are a called out assembly of people who love the Lord. And so, we say this, Lord, let your mercy be upon me. And let your mercy be upon all of us, according as we hope in the Lord. We hope together, and we get his mercy together. And we'll watch over each other together, because we love each other. And we want each other's success in Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are very grateful for this wonderful message. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in God. And as we hope in God, Lord, we also find that your blessings, your goodness is towards us. I ask you, Lord Jesus, for your hand to be on us. I ask you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy to be with us. I ask you to humble us, that we have fear, that we have trust, that we would have a hope in God. Lord, may we not stray from your precepts. May we not turn to the left hand or to the right. But may we walk in your ways ever and ever in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.